I'm old now, but I don't feel as though I should be. Not in the ravages of time is a cruel fate sort of way. No, what I mean is that I know now I wasn't supposed to be here this long. My 82nd birthday came two months ago, and it feels as though I've unjustly received over 50 extra years when that simply wasn't the plan. Not only that, but I've spent so much time in dread of the future that I didn't appreciate most of the time that I did have. All of these toilsome years wasted puttering around wishing I had just died in 72 just because I stopped in a diner for a cup of coffee back in 61. In 1961, I was still a hell-raising young man with a steady girl and a shitty car. Sarah and I had been together since our senior year of high school and with her father's permission, we had gotten engaged just a few months ago. My grandchildren tell me what an antiquated notion getting permission is, but hell, that's what you did back then. Sarah worked as a receptionist at the local pediatrician's office, and I was three years into an apprenticeship with a plumber named John Stevenson. Save your shitty job jokes for someone else. I promise that I have heard more than my fair share. Anyway, on a particularly gorgeous spring day, I called Sarah to tell her I was stopping by for breakfast on my way to work. She was sweet that kind of way. Even before we were married, she was still living with her parents. She insisted on fixing me a hot cup of coffee and a few fried eggs. I'm on my way, Sarah, I said into the receiver while I slid on my work coat. Oh, David, Sarah said and coughed into the phone. Not today. I'm not feeling well, and I don't think John would care much for you bringing a bug to him at work. Oh, that's okay, I replied. I'll stop by Lou's Cafe on the way in. The coffee's not as good as yours, but a guy has to have something. A guy best tell a girl to feel better soon, or he may not get any more coffee from her at all, she giggled. I smiled. I sure do hope you feel better soon, Sarah. I love you, dear. I love you, too. Do call me after work, Davy boy. And she hung up. Feeling a bit sad that I wouldn't get to see Sarah that day, I trotted down five blocks between my Cracker Box house and Lou's Cafe. It was my favorite restaurant in town, which isn't saying much. You either ate at Lou's or you ate at the Blue Fox. At Lou's, you could get a hot cup of joe, an open-faced roast beef sandwich, and a damn fine slice of pecan pie. The Blue Fox was likely to give you a lukewarm cup of sludge, bologna on stale rye, and a mild case of food poison. When I got to Lou's, I could see through the window that it was a bustling morning. Fortunately for me, there was still a two-seater near the window, so my eggs and coffee wouldn't be standing room only. My knees were better back then, but who the hell wants to stand up to eat and have a sunny side egg run down your work shirt? Morning, Davy, the big man behind the flat top yelled. At six foot four and sporting a black eye patch, courtesy of the D-Day invasion, Lou was a monster to look at, but as gentle as a puppy. Two sunny side and a hot cup? Please, I replied and waved in his direction. Just going to read the paper over here, Lou. Lou waved back and said, Marge, will have it out to you in a minute. Enjoy the funny, son. I laughed and smiled about the banter as I slid the chair facing the window back and sat down. Reaching into my jacket pocket, I pulled the rolled up new paper out onto the table and dove into the front page. The front page had been covered for two weeks with the news of the Bay of Pigs fiasco, 
and I had become a little obsessed. Kennedy seems like a pretty smart fella by my estimation, but this had been a mess. By the time Margie slid the eggs and coffee in front of me, I was basically in a stupor. With Sarah fattening you up, I hardly get to see you any more as it is, said the waitress as she walked to the table. I looked up at Margie, a grin across her face. She tossed me a wink. Glad to see you too, kiddo, even if you've always got your nose stuck in the paper. I smiled back at her. Sorry, Margie. I'm glad to see you too. Margie pulled the paper out of my hands, rolled it up, and sat it on the table before sliding the plate of eggs closer to me. Eat up. Paper will be there when you're done. She hustled off to the counter for another plate, and I dug into my eggs. Lou had even thrown in a piece of toast that morning, big old softy that he was. I looked down at my watch and saw that I still had 45 minutes to go before I was due at Mr. Stevenson's shop. Quickly polishing off the rest of my breakfast, I decided to get back to my paper for a bit before heading out. The noise of Lou slapping away at the grill, the conversations of the other diners, and the paper had put me into a kind of stupor. My family says I still get that way sometimes when I read. More so in my old age, probably, but I've always been that way. The written word had a way of hypnotizing me until I tuned out everything around me. When my kids come to visit sometimes, they will startle me out of a daze and tell me that they had knocked on the door for five minutes before letting themselves in, only to find me buried in a book. That was just the unaware state I was in when a hand fell on my shoulder and made me jump in my chair. My ass must have come off the seat five inches, but the hand stayed firmly but gently in place. Once my heart had descended from my throat, I scooted the legs of the chair around and turned my head. An older gentleman who looked to be in his sixties or seventies was standing behind me and making intense and uncomfortable eye contact with me. Are you David Newsom? The old man asked. His voice was soft but gravelly, as though he had a pack a day of lucky strike habit. While his face held few wrinkles, his ghostly white hair and beard gave away his age. The dark suit he wore was careworn with threadbare edges and finished off with scuffed loafers. Down on his luck, the old timers used to say. Well, yes, sir, I am. I replied politely, but with a bit of confusion. What can I help you with? Your parents are Albert and Clara Newsom? He asked without making any more eye contact. The old man just shuffled around the table and slowly lowered himself into the chair across from me. Lived in that nice old two-story colonial on Westmoreland Street, I do believe. I was surprised and confused. This gentleman seemed to have at least some knowledge of me and my family, but there was nowhere in my memory that I could locate even the faintest trace of him. I even tried to imagine him with darker hair and no beard, but still nothing. He was an enigma waiting to be decoded. Yes, Albert and Clara are my parents. I stammered after an awkward pause. Did you know them? I know a bit about them and a lot about you, but no. We never had the pleasure of meeting before they passed. He smiled at me sadly, and it looked as though tears were welling up in the corner of his eyes. I meant to get here before they passed. David, I am so, so sorry. My pulse raised, and I could feel my face getting hot. This absolute stranger sitting across from me was making me extremely uncomfortable. 
My parents had both passed away in a boating accident when I was 19. Their boat had taken damage and sank in a freak accident, and their bodies were never recovered. Mr. Stevenson had denied my request for a day off so that I could join them, or I would have shared the same fate. How in the hell could this man possibly have meant to come here before they died as though he expected it? Who the hell are you, mister? I spat out with more anger than I intended. That doesn't matter, David. A single tear ran down the side of his face and disappeared into the white hairs on his cheek. He reached into his tattered suit coat and pulled out an envelope and handed it to me. The flap was sealed with a mixture of gold and scarlet wax embossed with the impression of an hourglass. Looking at the hourglass emblem from my angle, it appeared that the sand was almost completely tumbled to the bottom. A bit remained at the top, but it was almost out of time. Read that letter tonight when you get home said the strange man. He stood haphazardly from his seat and began his unsteady shuffle past me toward the door. You'll have to make some choices. Wait, I yelled, but he just continued out the door. Stumbling from my seat and trailing behind him, I pushed the door open and walked out onto the sidewalk to try and get an explanation for this. He was gone. A few folks were walking into the hardware store, and Tom Benson, the barber, sitting outside of his barber shop, waiting for his first high and tight of the day. With the old man's wobbly gait and unsteady balance, there was no way he had made it out of eyesight that quickly. Nonetheless, he was gone as if he had been nothing more than a mirage. My workday finally came to a close, and I hurried home as though all of hell was on my hindquarters. The ridge of that envelope the old man gave me had rubbed against me from my shirt pocket the entire day as if it were trying to remind me that I had an engagement after work. Distracted as I was, I phoned Sarah to check on her and give her my well wishes. I told her I wasn't feeling well, which was mostly true, and that I was going to go to bed early that evening. As soon as the phone was back on the hook, I settled down in my hand-me-down recliner and stared at the envelope. I rotated the letter top to bottom, making the hourglass appear full and then empty over and over. Turned the correct way, the grains were almost all in the bottom of the glass. Fumbling out my pocket watch, I slipped it under the wax and peeled up the flap, exposing a yellow piece of paper, and three smaller envelopes numbered on them, one, two, and three, inside. I sat the smaller envelopes aside and started to read. David Allow me to apologize in advance if any of this causes you any distress. I have performed this task countless times with varying degrees of success. What these envelopes offer you is the ability to make choices that may well alter the life that lay ahead for you. Few receive this opportunity, so I hope you will consider whether or not this is the path you would choose to tread. In each envelope, I have enclosed a single piece of paper with a date and a single piece of advice. You may choose to accept or ignore the message on the paper, but there are certain to be consequences for either action. They are certain to help you avoid great tragedy. If you follow the advice, you may or may not be able to deduce what calamity you have avoided. Suffice it to say, if you accept the information and something unfortunate still befalls you, that a worst fate had been in store. 
please follow the preceding guidelines. Only open one envelope at a time. Read the information and determine if you will or will not adhere to the advice provided. If you opt not to that, it's fine enough. But if you do adhere to the information, then I only ask that you burn the note after the date at the top has passed you by. Second, do not open the following note until the date of the previous has already gone by. I have been working on this system for an incomprehensible amount of time, and I have discovered that too much information about one's future leads to incurable madness. For both your safety and sanity, do not open the next envelope until at least one day after the date of the previous. Last, but equally as important, do not speak to anyone about these notes. I care not for the privacy of my work, but I do care greatly for the safety of those around you. Anyone not affected by the information will simply likely laugh it off or think you're mad. However, Anyone who will be affected in some way by the information will suffer a similar fate as you would if you read the notes at the wrong time. I've yet to discover what causes this effect, but the foreknowledge of events causes those in your orbit to become self-harming and suicidal. If you decide against this, then please burn the notes today. Don't throw them out destroy them. If you opt to use this information, then store them away and keep them safe. It had been my intention to reach you before the untimely passing of your parents and envelope number one would have helped you avoid this tragedy. A new option was added in its place since I did not make it in time. I will carry the weight of this missed opportunity for the remainder of my long years. I am so, so sorry. Your life is still a path unrolling itself in a dark wood. A way has already been made clear, but I simply to offer you three chances to remap its course. Good luck, Joseph. My head was swimming with what I had just read. Velvety paper rubbed against my hands, and I could feel warm tears pooling in my eyes. I wanted to think of this as a disturbed musing of a crazy old man, but something in the pit of my heart urged me to accept it at face value. Even if it weren't true, would there be any harm in reading the first envelope? The date and information would make it obvious whether or not this outrageous letter was true. I stared at the stack of tiny envelopes and picked up the one on the top with the hand scrawled number one in the top upper left corner. My hand was shaking as I scooped up my pocket knife and slid it under the fold of the envelope and sliced it open. Sliding out the tiny piece of paper, I immediately read the scant writing on it. November 25th, 1969. Please choose the Teague job. That was it? The letter of explanation had clearly stated there wouldn't be much information, but I had still expected a bit more. I pulled my wallet out, and slid the note in behind a picture of Sarah. Eight years was a long time to wait and see, but what other choice did I have? Let's jump forward a little bit in time. I'll catch you up on the scuttlebutt in between. Sarah and I was married in 62 and lived in my little cracker box house until our first child, a boy, arrived in 64. We upgraded to a larger place and welcomed our second and last child, a girl in 66. 
Tyler and Megan were the apples of our eyes. They and the grandkids are still the only bright spot in the storm cloud that has been my life. Old man Stevenson retired and left me the plumbing business, which had been pretty generous to us. I didn't mind working ankle-deep in shit for my apprentice and journeyman years, but it was sure nice to have a few young bucks to handle the heavy lifting. We stayed steadily booked, and I was often left to turn down more jobs than I could take. Such was a good reputation in yesteryear. Still, the envelopes haunted my mind. I had been unimaginably happy all these years, but the closer we drew to 69, the more I thought about it. The other envelopes were stashed safely in a lockbox in my garage, but the first note still resided in my pocket. I would read it again, occasionally, when I noticed it and always pondered what that day may bring. Or, for that matter, if the day would bring any damn thing at all. On the morning of November 25th, 1969, I was sitting in my office chair, chatting it up with my employees when the phone rang. Stevenson Plumbing, I exclaimed into the phone, how can we help you today? Yes, our neighbor said to give you a call. The woman on the other end of the line replied, My name is Darla T, and we've just moved into town. There's a leaking pipe in our upstairs bathroom, and it has ruined my ceiling. Any chance you could send someone out my way today? My eyes widened and my pulse raised. Please choose the Teague job. Oh, I finally replied in a burst. My mind darted around as I stammered through. Yes, ma'am. My assistants already have some work lined up, but I'll head that way myself immediately. Mrs. Teague gave me her address, and I got out of the chair, legs half like jelly. I slid my old toolbox into the work truck and gave a wave to my assistants as I pulled out of the drive. It was the moment of truth, and I still debated whether this was a coincidence or providence. I arrived at the tea house, knocked on the door. A sweet young woman introduced herself as Mrs. T and showed me to the upstairs bathroom. The floor glistened with water, and a steady stream was flowing from behind the toilet. Can you fix it? She asked me with apprehension. Yes, ma'am, I replied in a certain tone. It's likely just a pinhole leak that has gotten out of control. Give me about an hour and I'll have you fixed up. She smiled and thanked me before leaving the room. I set my toolbox down in the hall to keep it away from the water and surveyed the bathroom. It was the day stated on the note. And here I was in the Teague household. Chuckling a little bit, I couldn't believe I had spent eight years with my thoughts dwelling on this date. There I stood in the bathroom of destiny. Maybe the old man could see the future, but I began to doubt that anything of consequences would be taking place here today. I straddled the toilet to try and find the source of the water, and it took no time at all. The hose that ran from the tank to the wall was the accordion-style copper tubing, and there was a pinhole leak I expected to find. There was a box of replacement parts in the work truck, and I was satisfied this would be a cut-and-dry job. Turning my torso to stabilize myself on the sink, I began to turn my foot to step out when I slipped in the water. My right leg slid between the toilet and the wall as I fell. The resounding sound as my tibia and fibula snapped in half sounded like a tree branch splitting in a windstorm. I howled in agony 
as the lightning bolts of pain radiated from my leg to the rest of my body. Mrs. Teague had found me and called an ambulance. Paramedics took me to the hospital, and the doctors ended up putting so many plates and screws in my leg that I could set off a metal detector from five feet away for the rest of my life. Well, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but you get the point. My leg was never the same again. A limp and my pessimistic outlook would become two of my most defining characteristics. After a few days in the hospital, I returned home with the aid of a wheelchair. My mood had been sour, and I was probably pretty unkind to Sarah and the kids. I spent most of my afternoons on the front porch, even though the developing December air was quite cold and unforgiving. On December 2nd, I was sitting on the porch, puffing on my pipe, when a black four-door sedan pulled up to the curb in front of my house. Two men in military dress got out and made their way up to the walk. Their stern faces made me uncomfortable. Hello, sir, the first man said. We're looking for Mr. David Newsom. Is this his residence? I furrowed my brow. That'd be me, gentlemen. What can I do for you? The two men looked at me and then down at my cast-wrapped leg. Their gaze drifted back up to my face and they returned my dismayed expression. Mr. Newsom, the conflict in Vietnam has escalated to a point that we as Americans must make bold moves in these uncertain times. The second man then barked. The Selective Service Office performed a military draft yesterday, and you have been selected to report for duty. My face changed from confusion to astonishment. You've got to be kidding, I yelled. Look at me. I'm not sure how much use you think I'll be in the jungle. The men conferred with one another with their backs turned to me. I sat in my wheelchair, blood boiling, waiting for them to tell me that some kind of accommodation would be made for my status and that I was still going to have to ship off to parts unknown to me. The first man turned to face me and said, Sir, I do believe an exception can be made here. Have a good day. They both returned to the black sedan and sped down the street. Of course, they could make an exception. What good would I be to anyone there? The doctors had already told me that the nature of the break was so severe that there was little to no chance I wouldn't walk with a limp for the rest of my days. That evening at the dinner table, after the kids had gone off to sleep, Sarah and I sat and chatted. Vietnam draft, huh? Sarah said, half question and half statement. Yep. I puffed, Vietnam. Sarah smiled, that heart-melting smile my way. Well, look on the bright side. If you hadn't broke your leg at the Teague job, you would be off for basic training. There's a sunny side to everything, I guess. I smiled back at her, but as I looked into those eyes that I now missed so much, I realized something. She was absolutely right. If I had sent one of the other boys to do that job, I would have never broken my leg. Without the leg, I would have gone off to that endless damn police action where so many men never made it back home. I likely would have died. Please choose the Teague job. The note was right. Somehow... That damn note had been right. Let's make up a bit of time here. Not every detail of my life is as interesting for you as it is for me. 
after Sarah had unwittingly made the connection between the note and the draft notice for me, I knew instantly that I needed to read the content of the next note. If the first one had saved my life, then the second one must be equally important. One day, when she was out, I had used my crutches to hobble out to the garage and retrieve the second note. September 17, 1972 You must not go to the grocery store. It seems simple enough. Three years to sit on one piece of advice. I just had to skip going to the grocery store. The first one hadn't been any more complicated, so I was relieved at the simplicity of this one as well. Even if I stayed home and broke the other damn leg, I could live with it, and so I did. September 17th of 72 rolled around, and life was much as it had been for me the three years earlier. The business was booming by now, and I had hired a full staff. My leg healed, but never quite regained the agility it once had so I ran the day-to-day operations and had a team of plumbers who took care of the jobs. Both of the kids were out of diapers and started to sleep through the night, so Sarah and I thanked God every day for the little moments of quiet in the evening. We even toyed around with the thought of just one more baby, but that was not to be. I was tapping the steering wheel with my hand and bouncing my head side to side to the radio. A new band called Looking Glass was singing about a girl named Brandy, and what a fine girl she was. With the upbeat tune, I had been inclined to agree. My disposition at the time was pretty damn sunny. The last three years had been some of the best in my life. I woke up every day feeling like I had a new lease on life, and it was all thanks to those strange notes. Pulling into the driveway, I saw Sarah in the front yard with the kids. I got out of the car and started walking their way. Hey, sweetie, Sarah exclaimed. I'm about to head to the grocery store. You think we ought to pack up the kids and go as a family? There it was. I had been waiting all day and had prepared myself for all of the eventualities. No grocery store for me that afternoon under any circumstances. The note had been right about the plumbing job, and I trusted it for this one as well. I'm a little beat, hon, I replied, hamming it up for a little believability. Mind if I just stay home with the kids? so it'll be a little quicker for you. She kissed me on the cheek and started getting in the car. That'll be fine, Mr. Lazy Bones. I'll be back in about an hour. Make sure everyone is ready to eat when I get home. Sarah put the car in reverse and backed out of the driveway, waving at me as she did. I still remember that wave, that beautiful smile, I miss her so much, it makes my heart ache. Sarah Archer Newsom was one of a kind, and for a small number of years, I was able to call her mine. Pardon me for the sparse details ahead, but even as I begin to tell it to you, I'm already in tears. These days, usually I'm mad, But this just brings me to deep sorrow that I feel in my bones. I dwell on the details enough as it is, so I will keep it as short as I can. And here goes. Sarah didn't come home from the store in an hour. She didn't come home at all. An hour had gone by, and she hadn't shown up. No big deal. Another hour and she still wasn't there. I decided to go ahead and feed the kids and get them off to bed. Still, 
no Sarah. I called Harlow's Market, and the store manager said he hadn't seen her, but he could have just missed her. It had been a busy night, something about beef and poultry special. I sat on the porch smoking my pipe as my children slept inside. It wasn't unusual for me to enjoy an evening pipe, but my nerves waiting for Sarah to return had me so stirred up that I was working on my third round. Seems like I was about to go ask the neighbor to keep an eye on the kids while I went to look for her when I saw the blue and red lights flashing around the corner coming towards my house. The patrol car pulled into the drive and James Templeton, the chief of police, got out and started walking toward me. Evening, David. James said. He took his uniform hat off and fumbled it around in his hands. James, I stammered. Is she okay? He wouldn't look me in the eyes. David, I'm sorry. He replied, eyes still downcast. She was sitting at the railroad tracks over on Dixon Avenue. Guess she was headed to the store. The train came off of the tracks and he stopped. I collapsed back in my chair and began to weep. James started talking again, but I don't know what in the hell he said to me. The only thing that mattered was that she was gone. So here I am now, old bitter and angry most of the time. My kids and grandchildren come over pretty often, and it lifts my spirits. Don't get me wrong. I love my children and grandchildren like nothing left in this world. The trouble is that every time I see them, all I can think is how much Sarah would have loved these moments. But she never got to see it. Why hadn't that damnable note said anything more specific? It just said, you. Why in absolute hell couldn't it have said, no one? Would it have been so damn hard to spare Sarah and me both? The first note had seemed like a godsend, but the second note has tortured me more than anything in the world ever could have. I'm relieved that the children weren't in the car that day. If you want to know the truth, I wish I would have died with her. I feel like I should have died with her, but now I've dragged on all these 50 years and felt every day that I shouldn't be here anymore. Maybe if I just burned all the notes... I would have died in some jungle overseas, like so many other young men I'd grown up with. If that happened, then maybe it would have changed the course of everything for Sarah, and she would still be here. I'll never know, but it will haunt me for whatever wretched time I have left. I bet you're wondering about the third note. Did I open it? The answer is yes, but not until last week. For a decade, I couldn't even bear the thought of reading one more of them. But then, last week, I decided whatever information the note had to share must be over and done with by now. I fished the old lunchbox out of the junk bin in my garage and opened it up. April 3rd. 2022. Go have dinner at Lou's. I'm sitting across the street from the old diner right now, in front of where old Tom Vincent's barber shop used to be. It's some damn vape shop or something now. The lights are on in the old diner. Some young fella bought it a few years back and restored it to its glory days. Looked just like it did when old Lou was still alive. 
I can see a handful of people chattering at the tables and a young gentleman standing behind the flat-top grill talking to a pretty young waitress. And I see an old man with white hair and a long white beard sitting at a table by the window. His suit is tattered looking and threadbare just as it had been all those years ago. His hand is resting on the table on top of what looks like three small envelopes. He isn't making eye contact with me from across the street, but I'm sure he knows I'm here. Seeing him fills me with rage and fear. I don't want to go in, but I somehow feel bound to this, though. One note pointed me to salvation. The second filled me with despair. Perhaps the third will lead me to answers, or if I'm lucky, it'll lead me to Sarah. I'd best be going, folks. It's getting late, and I need to get inside.